We all know that food is one of the most needed and loved substances to keep us alive and happy. But some of us take it for granted. You know it would be extremely difficult to produce such ingredients like wheat, corn, only just to name a few. We all can thank the beloved tractor for gaining these types of foods. In this episode I'll be taking a look at the local tractor company. They go by the name of Marshall and Sons. I shall be looking at the 1950s and the 1983 models, both on display at the Lincolnshire Life Museum in the city of Lincoln. Marshall and Sons started to produce tractors in the early 1900s. At that time they were making a start on an internal combustion engine tractors. They were called the Collinals. They had a power of 16 to 32 HP. It isn't comparable to the modern HP. In around 1928, the company started to develop a tractor similar to the Lands Bulldog from Germany. The Lands Bulldog looks nothing like the tractors we see today. It has quite an interesting appearance. The tractor to some looks like it would be part of the Trainline company. All four wheels are slightly the same height. It's not one of the biggest machines I have seen, but by far very interesting design indeed. I got in contact with two gentlemen, Derek Broughton and Norman Slater. Derek is a volunteer at the Lincolnshire Life Museum and Norman who once worked for Marshall and Sons. So, what was working at the company like? It was good, uh, because it was like a, a family firm, if you know what I mean. Um, my, my dad worked there, my grandfather worked there, and uh, it was just people we went to school with. Where they played football and cricket with, and uh, who you know from school. Uh, there was two big firms in, in games, but uh, the engineering line was Marshalls and Roses. And uh, them days, of course, you didn't have uh, a, uh, what, uh, a careers officer advising what you should do. When you got to 14, that was it. You, you uh, found yourself a job, or your parents suggested a job. Being as my dad worked at Marshalls, uh, it was easy to get a job there for what for anybody for that matter. And you just started there uh, as an office boy running around. And then uh, if you was any good lad, you know, uh, you was uh, offered a, an apprenticeship either to be a fitter or a joiner or a welder or electrician, whatever. And you chose what you wanted. And, and obviously then uh, when you got established, you went with different people learning their skills, you got the bad habits as well of course, and then you went to, to tech college and night school and uh, until you uh, was 21 and then um, you, you sort of qualified as a fitter or whatever. Uh, and then of course you, got, you went in the army then anyway, like, oh, of course, whatever. If, if you're fit enough for that, you're a national service line. Right? But if you don't like it, it was, it was a, uh, like a, uh, well, I would say a family firm because it was out of the size. But, um, you know most people there. To be honest, the money was never that great, but uh, the, the friendship and camaraderie, like if you like, was all right, and, and uh, people enjoyed being there, right? Yeah. And of course, they made a lot of diverse different things, like during the war and after. The main uh, features was uh, diesel rollers and, uh, and tractors and, and boilers. That was the main thing. But in the war, they did a lot of diverse things. They did. Built some uh, mini, uh, sub miniature submarines and uh, uh, guns and uh, that sort of thing, you know. In in interesting work it was. Derek talks more about the technical side of the tractors. Um, I'd always um, been an engineering and uh, I've always loved all machinery. Mm -hmm. And it's a sort of natural, natural progression, in fact, that's me to go up. 
and um, see what they did up there, and there is a chance to play with vintage machinery, which I fully enjoy. But you could know, it's really been my up there past when things were made properly, you know, made handmade and uh, not thrown together. So, as working there, you are surrounded by many magnificent artefacts. But the main artefact that I want to look at today is the two Marshall tractors, the green right. 1950 model and the oh, yellow yes. 1983 model. How long has the museum opened these to show to the public? Um, they are the, the old one, the green one is actually loaned to the museum by an entry of the Ashley County. But the later one, the county council, the yellow one, the county council actually bought that when the, the liquidation site of Marshall's factory. So it is a one-off, a really special prototype that never actually went into production. If the film was survived a bit longer, they might have been selling them, but never got around to it. They went bust before that happened. As I set my eyes on the green 1950s model, I was amazed to see how tall it was to oneself. I stand at 5 feet and 7 inches, and the top of the back two wheels meet me at neck height. Now, compare them to the front two wheels, it's very different. They both just about come up to my waist. Towards the front of the tractor there is a large pipe, followed by a rounded and striped front. So, how reliable was this machine? Um, it's still, it's very, it was very reliable. It was an actual fact in his day, it was an easy enough, you know, that's what he's in there, um, Fords were making tractors, for instance, by the bucket for. Um, this was by the thousand on a mass production line with a very cheap um, uh, petrol engine, well, petrol comparative engine, also the diesel engine. The Marshalls built these tractors, they were handmade on a, by the, by the, by the, in a very small batch in about 20 or 30 at a time. And whereas, Marshall, whereas Ford's made literally thousands, Marshalls made hundreds. They were almost a different beast. They were very economical, they only they used cheap diesel, diesel fuel which is cheap in those days, and they only had one big cylinder at the engine, which when the engine went around very slowly, so they were absolutely bomb proof and totally reliable. But the only problem was with them, they were a, a pain to start. And this is one thing that killed them off actually, because um, floors were making tractors with electric starters, and the marshals, you had to wind it, you, know, you had to wind a very large handle and it was really hard work. Marshall's actually developed for the machine, and very interesting that they also for starting it. Um, instead of an electric starter, you actually, um, on a smooth little cap at the front of the engine, and screwed in what was basically a shot bug cartridge without the pellets, an explosive device. So you screw this into a little container in front of the engine, set all the controls in the right position, and gave this little thing a clout. And it went off back just like a shotgun cartridge, and then the explosion was just to turn the engine over. It's worked most of the time, but um, those in the know, and those that work with them regularly, would never stand in a certain position in front of the marshal when you started it like that, because the whole thing has been known to explode and um, take your foot off or something. So they were um, an interesting machine. The other problem was, too, actually, being a single cylinder compared with a modern tractor, they were very. The pull of the engine was very uneven. They, everybody calls them pop pops, and they were the exhaust was pop 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 like that. And um, if you got them at a certain speed, you'll find yourself in you crash the seat almost in synchronisation with the engine. But they would pull right down to a very very low rev, so they would pull and they would pull and they would pull. Whereas a one modern tractor, um, you could pull the engine down and it would just fall and stop, stall out, stop on you. But you can hardly stall out the marshal. They were too well made, too brutal, really. They're a wonderful machine, but they were anachronism at the time.
following generation of the Mark tractor dates back to 1983. It's the prototype yellow 554 model, and yes, this little beauty is one fine example of the modern tractor we know of today. The tractor is far more rectangular than its past family member. Also, there is a dramatic change to the wheels. The front wheels are slightly smaller than the 1950s tyres, but the tyre treads are a lot more thicker. There is more room for the driver to drive the machine. Oh, it was a total improvement on the original design, yeah. But, I um, mean, it was then, basically, it was a, um, it was a different breed of tractor. It kind of had a modern diesel engine, a high diesel engine. And it was basically the kind of kit put together. The field margin of this whole tractor, the problem what was a, the whole thing was built and designed and assembled, manufactured like Marshalls. Basically, the only thing that was bought in the steering wheel and the tyres, rubber tyres. But the later Marshall tractor, it was a Meccano kit really, it was a Perkins engine with somebody else's gearbox and somebody else's axles, and basically what Marshall just did was brought it all together. Which meant basically that was one of the reasons why they went bust really, that um, instead of the whole thing being designed in house, when you control over it and you can control the prices and everything, when you're buying in somebody else's bits, Putting them all together, uh, your profit margin isn't there so much. That's one reason why they went to the war, really. They just couldn't keep up. They, they couldn't make enough money. So they went to war. It was, it was a, well, the top top marshal was an individual machine. Uh, what they were building later on, like the yellow one, the 554, was just, well, it was just the same when anybody's tractor. You could walk into a John Deere showroom, buy a John Deere, you could walk into a Massey Ferguson, buy a Massey Ferguson. Walk into a Ford, buy a Ford, walk into Marshall, buy a Marshall. They basically do all the same job, but the same, all those the different colours. Well, half of the so the money was the same anyhow. So, really, um, the modern machine was different. It was a bit of a work all right, but um, you can't put the same character on the old one, really. But um, there again, it was immature, really, because um, Marshall went buff and it was the end of the line. Last question. Yeah. While you were working at the company, how many yeah. workers were there roughly? <laughs> the, old, the old answer is about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, well, it's hard to say really because, I mean, you, you got all that four or five thousand during the war. And, and then, of course, uh, uh, for different reasons, like uh, people left and uh, the, the work that busy. So I, I really couldn't, couldn't say how. how how many there was really, you know, to, to, to be right, I've maybe in some uh, book somewhere there is some knowledge about how many was employed there, but uh, it's eight day of course was in the war because you have seven night shift as well because of, of the war, um, so I, I'd, I'd be added in a guess like, you know, 2,000 or so, somewhere like that, I might be way out, but um, in, in the last stages it wasn't that many because we didn't know so many different things like, you know, uh, we built some st contract stuff and whatever, you, and uh, when Leyland's took over, then uh, I, I'm not blaming them, but it's like the beginning of the end, if you, like, you know what I mean.